Hey guys, uh, today we're going to be discussing Dan Dennett explaining the magic of consciousness. Now, we already have seen Dennett uh, about a week ago when we discussed a chapter from his 1991 book, Consciousness Explained. Uh, now we're going to see an updated essay he made about a decade later. So let's recap. Um, in Consciousness Explained, Dennett analyzed the appeal of dualism in relation to our desire for mystery. Remember, he said, we only think that consciousness is this non-physical transcendent substance because we have this desire for mystery. We don't like to diminish our experiences and, and we want it to be true, right? Think X-Files. I want to believe. That's, that's the kind of thing that Dennett is saying. So, and he gave multiple critiques of dualism uh, the first one was that dualism seems to presuppose this non-physical self, right? The I, and that this is the quote-unquote ghost in the machine, right? This is the real you that's like sitting inside your, your mind, how they portray in, in Black Mirror and a lot of TV shows and, and movies and stuff. And the problem is uh, there isn't any I that you can observe. If I sit here and crack open your skull... I'm not going to see a self, right? I'm not going to see that driver, so to speak, that's the real you. So the idea of a self as something non-physical cannot be empirically verified, right? It is not objectively observable by means of the scientific method. Second critique of dualism, it can't overcome the problem, and this is a logical problem, of how non-physical substance can interact with physical substance. Right, the whole idea, this is when he uh, showed that cartoon of Casper the Friendly Ghost. It's like, if something is non-physical, it's non-physical, meaning it cannot cause physical changes or interact with physical stuff. So, he thinks we're kind of getting ourselves into a muddle when we say, oh yeah, consciousness is non-physical, but it has these physical properties. And so it's like when Casper the friendly ghost can walk through walls, but then like catch a glass if it fell off the table. It, it doesn't make any sense. It's this like unscalable logical problem. Uh, and thirdly, as a result of all this, belief in dualism is just unscientific, right? And, and maybe even illogical. And he says it's akin to just giving up. It's something you default on when you want to believe something and not something that you pursue honestly when you have objectivity and reason in mind. Uh, so that said, we're taking this about, let's see, 12 years later um, in this essay he had called Explaining the Magic of Consciousness. Now, after we did Dennett last time, um, we did two chapters from Chalmers' book from 96 called The Conscious Mind, and we started to see a discussion between these two opposing viewpoints. And now we're going to see Dennett's response to Chalmers, right? So it's like Dennett speaks, Chalmers responds, Dennett responds. So you're seeing a conversation unfold before your very eyes. And so just to recall, you want to think about Chalmers' distinction between the easy problems and the hard problems of consciousness. Because he said there were some things that were quote-unquote easy and some things that were quote-unquote hard. And recall what he meant by that. He said that these issues pertaining to uh, the physical properties of the mind, such as what is the chemical makeup of these things, how is information travel across different parts of the brain, uh, which parts of the brain light up during a scan, during certain kinds of behaviors. He says these are all easy problems. Why are they easy problems? Not because they're literally easy, they're quite difficult, but they're easy because science in its current form can figure these things out, right? The empirical methods of science are able to figure out, you know, how electricity flows across neurons, right? So these are all problems pertaining to the quote-unquote psychological components of mind. That's the easy problems. But the hard problem had to deal with qualia, 
the hard problem had to deal with, with quote-unquote subjective experience. He says, how is it that all that lumpy gray matter, all that mush, results in this like crazy rich inner movie that you're feeling that you are behind your eyes? It's very strange. It's very strange. The quantitative stuff is relatively easy, but the qualitative stuff, it's hard. That what it is like to be conscious. That's the hard problem. So recall this distinction um, because Dennett is going to draw upon it in his essay. And by the way, I apologize. You can hear some stuff in the back. That is my fiance. She is meeting with her students right now. So let's take a look at page seven, right? The begin. I think this is the abstract, actually, of the essay. Uh, Dennett says, It is, however, possible that what appears to be the hard problem is simply the large bag of tricks that constitute what Chalmers calls the easy problems of consciousness. These all have mundane explanations requiring no revolutions in physics, no emergent novelties. I cannot prove that there is no hard problem, but Chalmers cannot prove that there is. He can appeal to your intuitions, but this is not a sound basis on which to found a science of consciousness. The magic, as in the supposed unexplainability of consciousness, like stage magic, defies explanation only so long as we take it at face value. Once we appreciate all the non-mysterious, that is, explainable ways in which the brain can create benign user illusions, we can begin to imagine how the brain creates consciousness. Okay, so he comes out the gate swinging. He's digging at Chalmers here. He's talking about how Chalmers has this thing called the hard problem and how he thinks it's this unanswerable question, um, or at least unanswerable within the scientific paradigm that currently exists. And Dennett's saying, no, there. I don't really think there is a, a hard problem in the way he's describing. Really, the thing Chalmers is calling the hard problem is just a large bag of tricks made up of a bunch of different easy problems. Very interesting. Um, and when Chalmers makes his argument, of course, he's appealing to our intuition, right? What it feels like. I just really feel like I'm a conscious agent and I have this thing called self. But then it attacks this mode of reasoning. He says, it's not a sound basis on which to fa uh, found a science of consciousness, which is very interesting because you want to remember when Chalmers was arguing for dualism, he wasn't just saying, oh, it feels nice. Oh, I really think I have this thing. Of course, he used that as a rhetorical technique to grab your attention, but once he presented his arguments, he used logical arguments. So what we're seeing here is not merely uh, a dichotomy between science and intuition, but rather a dichotomy between science and logic, which is very interesting because typically people think these are the same things. Oh, science is logic and logic is science. No. And we, we have a very concrete example of that not being the case because Chalmers is using logical arguments to prove dualism, but these arguments in themselves are non-scientific. And that doesn't mean that they're automatically not good. They could not be good, and I think this is what Dennis, uh, Dennett is trying to tell us. But I want you to think about how when philosophers talk about logic, they're not talking about the same thing as what scientists talk about and at the very least this should kind of raise your curiosity like oh that's weird but anyway uh dennett's going to conclude that consciousness is like stage magic like a magician doing tricks and what it does is like the magician it creates a number of user illusions in other words fake things that you think are real. And if Dennett's right, it's a hard pill to swallow. And he might be right. So we got we to gotta see his argument. So to continue, he says, It seems to many people that consciousness is a mystery, the most wonderful magic show imaginable, an unending series of special effects that defy explanation. I think they are mistaken. That consciousness is a physical biological phenomenon like metabolism or reproduction or self-repair 
that is exquisitely ingenious in its operation, but not miraculous, or even in the end, mysterious. Part of the problem of explaining consciousness is that there are powerful forces acting to make us think that it is more marvelous than it actually is. In this, it is like stage magic, a set of phenomena that exploit our gullibility and even our desire to be fooled, bamboozled, or awestruck. Okay, again, he's not denying that it feels like consciousness is this non-physical, almost mystical thing. Like, he gets that, right? It seems like that. But his point is, not everything is like it seems. And interestingly enough, you could think of Plato here, right? They thought the shadows on the wall were real. It seemed like they were real, but they weren't. So your beliefs aren't always in accord with reality. And then it's saying the mundane, everyday explanation of consciousness is like that, right? It doesn't actually correspond to reality. Um, and in the end, it's not that mysterious. It's a, a wonderful piece of machinery, but this mystery that we propose is there, it's not really there. It's just there because we stop analyzing. Um, and he says there are powerful forces acting to make us think it's more marvelous than it is. So there's a reason why we think this way, and it's not just cultural, because I think maybe some of you got that impression in the last uh, lesson on Dennett. And while that's certainly a factor, there's something more to it. And ultimately, it's going to have something to do with the brain. And so already you see Dennett thinks the brain is a reality, whereas this thing called the mind, that's what consciousness is, is not a reality in the way that it seems. Right? And, and this thing, this brain and these cultural beliefs, they exploit our gullibility, right? our desire to be awestruck. To continue um, on page eight, he says, the task of explaining stage magic is in some regards a thankless task. The person who tells people how an effect is achieved is often resented, considered a spoil sport, a party pooper. I often get the impression that my attempts to explain consciousness provoke similar resistance. Isn't it nicer if we are all allowed to wallow in the magical mysteriousness of it all? Or even this, if you actually manage to explain consciousness, they say you will diminish us all, turn us into mere protein robots, mere things. So what he's doing is a thankless task. It's something that he thinks is correct and important but that other people don't like. And they don't like it, not because he's wrong, not because his reasoning is weak, but because they don't like the conclusions he's reaching. So they're kind of putting their desire for what they want above, of, uh, above analysis here. Right, isn't it nicer if consciousness is this m mysterious thing like how Chalmers explains? The critique is that if you explain consciousness physically, reductively, to use Chalmers' language, you reduce us to the level of things, of objects, right? There's no difference between us and a computer. And that's really frightening. Uh, Dennett, of course, wants to dispel these frights. And he brings in a super interesting analogy here. He continues with this magic stuff. So on page eight, he says, uh, the comparison between consciousness and stage magic is particularly apt for the romantic and gullible among us have much the same yearning regarding stage magic that they have regarding consciousness. Lee Siegel draws our attention to the fundamental twist in his excellent book, Net of Magic, Wonders and Deceptions in India. And so here's a passage from the book. I'm writing a book on magic, I explain, and I'm asked, real magic? By real magic, people mean miracles, thaumaturgical acts, and supernatural powers. No, I answer, conjuring tricks, not real magic. Real magic, in other words, refers to the magic that is not real, while the magic that is real, that can actually be done, is not real magic for people. So then it says, it cannot be real if it is explicable as a phenomenon achieved by a bag of ordinary tricks, and cheap tricks, you might say. And that is just what many people claim about consciousness, too. So let us pursue the parallel with stage magic and see how some of the effects of consciousness might be explained. Right? So the point is, 
when people watch a magic show, they swear that they see things that did not actually happen. And the thing that they swore they saw happen actually turns out to be nothing more than a series of cheap tricks, than a sleight of hand, as Dennett says in the abstract. And the same thing is going to be at play for consciousness, too. He says, for more than a thousand years, and this is an example of a magic trick, for more than a thousand years, the Indian rope trick has defied all attempts at explanation. Not some simple stunt in which a rope is thrown into the air and then climbed by the agile magician, the full Indian rope trick. The Indian rope trick of legend is a much more shocking episode of magic. And this is the description. He says, the magician throws a rope into the air where it hangs its top somehow invisible. A young assistant climbs the rope and disappears into thin air, but then is heard to taunt the magician, who takes a huge knife in his teeth and climbs the rope himself, disappearing in turn. A terrible fight is heard but not seen, and bloody limbs, a torso, and a freshly severed head fall out of the sky onto the carpet beneath the rope. The magician reappears, climbing sadly down the rope, and bewailing the hot temper that has led him to murder his young assistant, he gathers up all the bloody body parts and places them in a large covered basket and asks the audience to join him in a prayer for the dead little boy, whereupon the lad jumps whole out of the basket and all is well. Has it ever been performed? Nobody knows. Thousands, perhaps millions of people over hundreds of years have fervently believed that they themselves or their brothers or uncles or cousins or friends had witnessed the great spectacle with their own eyes. So that's very interesting. But wait, many people sincerely believe that this trick has been performed. Some of them apparently sincerely believe that they have seen the trick performed. If some people sincerely believe that they have seen it performed, does not that settle it? What else is a magic trick but the creation of sincerely held false beliefs about having witnessed one marvelous event or another? The magician doesn't really saw the lady in half. He only makes you think you saw you do it. And that is going to be his connection to consciousness. There is these sets of falsely held beliefs about us seeing or feeling or even being something. But just like the magician saws the lady in half and doesn't really, his conclusion is going to be, it seems like consciousness is this thing, but it's not really that thing. When the topic is brain science, something similar can take place. When we think about the phenomena of consciousness and wonder how they are accomplished in the brain, it is not at all unusual to fall back on the hyperbolic vocabulary of magic. The mind plays tricks on us. Take deja vu, for instance. Some have thought it a phenomenon at the magical end of the spectrum. According to them, we sometimes experience events that we know we have experienced before, in another life, in another astral plane, in another dimension. And we wonder what stunning insights this gives us into the cyclical nature of time, the transmigration of the soul, precognition, ESP. Pretty exciting stuff. But then we come to recognize that the phenomena of deja vu could be explained in a much simpler way. You do not actually remember having experienced this very event at some time in the past. You just mistakenly think that you do. So he's going to use all these fun analogies um, to try and explain why we're mistaken about consciousness. So he talks about magic. Now he's talking about deja vu. Everyone has experienced deja vu at one point or another, right? When you see something and then you have this indescribable feeling that, oh, this has happened before. I've, I've lived this very moment before. And what does your mind jump to? Oh, I had a dream of this. Or I had a dream of something similar. Or I did experience it in another life. Or something crazier, right? We get all these ideas that don't actually have any proof. Um... But Dennett's point is deja vu can be explained scientifically. Same thing about consciousness. Now he draws a parallel to the perception of art and the nature of uh, sensory perception in general. He says, 
Another startling effect is the filling in we can think we discover in our own visual experience. The first time I spied on Bellotto's view of Dresden on a distant wall in the North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh, I took it for a canaletto and eagerly approached it, expecting to enjoy up close the exquisite detail that Canaletto lavished on his Venice ships and gondolas, right down to the rigging lines, the buckets on the shoes, the plumes in the hats. The assorted crowd of people moving across the Dresden Bridge in the sunlight promised a feast of costumes and carriages. But as I got closer, the details I could have sworn I had seen from afar evaporated before my eyes. Nothing but artfully placed blobs of paint were there to be seen up close. So I tried to put the images in the slide. If you look at the actual essay, you'll see bigger images of this. And if you watch the video that I'm gonna post at the end of this, you'll see bigger images of this. So the top image is the painting, like the whole painting that you see across the room. And he says, oh, I think this is a painting by Canaletto who uses a lot of detail. So he starts to walk up close and that's the second painting or the second image, it's the same painting. And then when he gets even closer, he starts to recognize there's no detail there. Not even like there's some detail, but less. There's basically no detail here. There's just blobs of paint. And that's the, the third image on the bottom. And the whole point is that viewed from afar, it seemed like there was all this detail there, but when he got closer, he realized that his brain was just tricking him into believing that something was there or even existed that didn't exist in the form that he thought it did. So he says, in short, like a stage magician, the brain cheats. Many people I have discovered react to this suggestion with outraged disbelief. Not my brain. An understandable loyalty, but unwarranted and ungrounded. This is precisely what you do not know from personal first-person experience. As Siegel says, magic reveals how wrongly we remember what we have seen, discloses the way in which memory is the bearing and nursing uh, mother of illusion. Memory is the magician's assistant, confederate, and shill. Hearing the description of a trick I've done, I'm amazed at what's described, at the way in which memory has tricked the spectator far more audaciously than I. Right? Your brain cheats. Just like your brain makes you think things happen when you experience deja vu, just like your brain makes you think that something happens uh, when you perceive artworks or even these optical illusions, which he goes into detail about in the essay, and just like the brain makes you think you saw stuff during a magic show, it's just a trick. It's just a trick, right? And But you, you deny this. Not me. I'm an expert. Not my brain. Everyone has this reaction. It's totally natural. Um, but it's not true, at least not according to Dennett. And our job is to see if his argument is well-founded. And he kind of comes to a conclusion about how he's conceptualizing consciousness as a whole. He says, if you leave the subject in your theory, you have not yet begun. A good theory of consciousness should make a conscious mind look like an abandoned factory, full of humming machinery and nobody home to supervise it or enjoy it or witness it. Okay, you guys know what the subject is at this point. The subject in the history of philosophy is not an object. It's the thing perceiving the objects, the thing thinking about the objects, the thing feeling the thoughts and experiences of the object, right? This is the conscious being. This is the conscious mind. But for Dennett, the subject isn't really there. The subject is this kind of naive starting point that we all take. And it's an understandable starting point for the same reason that Anytime something seems to be the case, you start with that. Um, but actually, when you're willing to leave the cave, so to speak, you realize that what you thought you believed was actually incorrect. And so Dennett thinks any theory of consciousness that retains the subject in the conventional sense is wrong. And not even wrong, it's like it hasn't even begun. They haven't even done the real analysis.
And so people think, wait, but if you explain consciousness reductively in physical terms, you just leave us like mere protein robots, mere things. And he says, yeah, and that's fine. A good theory should make consciousness just look like an abandoned factory of machinery and no experiencer, right? No witnesser to supervise it. That's the point. Just because our conclusion is something we don't like does not mean our analysis of it should be skewed. So there's a TED Talk uh, that goes along with this essay that came came out around the same time. I, I think it was like 2003. Um, it's called The Illusion of Consciousness. Check it out. It's basically him presenting the information in the essay and giving little original tidbits here and there. And there's a bunch of fun um, experiments he has you engage in uh, that have to deal with optical illusions and noticing perceptual changes and all that cool stuff. Um, definitely fun. I usually would show this in class, so I highly recommend checking this out. It'll help you understand the essay more. It'll help you understand this lecture more. So definitely a good time. Uh, but here's the questions that we want to end with for today. Is Dennett right? Is it true? Um, when Chalmers makes these dualistic arguments that seem logical, are they really? Or is he just exploiting our brain's weaknesses? That's the point, right? It seems like these things like uh, the argument for phenomenal zombies, the argument for the inverted spectrum, the knowledge argument with Mary's room, it seems like these things really do prove logically that physicalism understood as the claim that consciousness supervenes in the physical cannot be true. But do they really do that? They may, right? The point, like the reason... I'm presenting the information in this way, excuse me, is not to say, oh, Dennett has the last word because he's right and there's nothing else to say. No, not at all. It's just to show you a back and forth. It's to show you that they each have a chance to respond to each other in one way or another. So is Chalmers' arguments correct? Or are they just doing, as Dennett says, exploiting our brain's weaknesses? Is Chalmers just like the magician sawing the lady in half? and making us think that he really did saw, saw a lady in half. Another criticism you might have is, maybe when Chalmers says physicalism is the belief that consciousness supervenes on the physical, maybe that's not a good characterization. Like maybe his thought experience, um, experiment sorry, do actually prove that consciousness doesn't supervene on the physical, but hey, that's not what physicalists say. So he's not disproving physicalism. I don't know. There's like a bunch of ways you might approach this issue. So start thinking about how you would respond here, right? You're seeing a, a contemporary conversation in action. And more importantly, you've now hit a point where you've seen thousands of years of history on the same subject unfold. And this kind of the, por uh, the point of the course is to see, you know, going all the way back to Plato, uh, and Aristotle and Descartes and Locke and all these people up until Dennett and Chalmers today, we're supposed to see how the conversation about the mind-body problem, about consciousness, about subjects and objects, is something that has a rich history that still isn't quite solved, right? And we've trying to been uh, comparing all these theories throughout the semester, and now our job is to really, really think about what developments have been made, what moves were good moves, what moves were not good moves, if there's any way we can solve some of the issues that we've encountered historically, if we should discredit the, the history completely, or, or neither of these things, right? Um, just some questions you might want to consider. So we'll stop there, guys. Um, as always, let me know if you have any questions. I'll see you around.